Brought to you by Squarespace. On May 1st, 1960, the Soviets managed to shoot down the U-2 spy plane flown by Francis Gary Powers. A victory for the Soviets and an embarrassing moment for the CIA, this event pushed forward the development of one of the most insane and futuristic projects of the Cold War. Drone spy planes in the 1960s. Developed to be a small unmanned version of the A-12, this drone would have been a game changer for the CIA and reconnaissance missions. But it actually ended up in the Soviet hands instead and led to the creation of America's worst nightmare. This is the black sheep of the Lockheed family, the A-12's daughter, the top secret D-21. Hey, don't forget we've got a new merch store where you can jump on and check out some cool items from our shop. Thanks for supporting the channel. The American government was taken by surprise. The fact that the Soviets were finally able to shoot down planes like the U-2 pushed the CIA and the US Air Force to come up with a new solution for spying on the vast territory of the Soviet Union. The Lockheed Skunk Works answered the call with the legendary A-12 and its subsequent variant, the SR-71, but there was still that fear of pilots being captured in the unlikely case of a shootdown somewhere over the Soviet territory. The mad lad himself, Kelly Johnson, the lead engineer behind the A-12, offered another solution to the problem, with a simple twist, removing the pilot out of the equation. No pilot, no problem. And without a pilot, this aircraft could go a heck of a lot faster. This spy plane idea was incredible for the time. In a world with computers too big to even fit in buildings, to come up with something like this took the right stuff. And you can show the world your own right stuff with the Squarespace website, today's video sponsor. They have plenty of great templates or you can have a go building your own design with their powerful code-free builder. They have built-in e-commerce tech to add products and start selling, in-built email campaign marketing that's easy to use, and their sites are already optimized for mobile phones. Plus, when you click that link, you're actually supporting the channel and everybody who works here to fund the animations and videos that you love so much. So clicking that link is a big win-win. To get it, simply go to www.squarespace.com found and get 10% off your first site and domain. Become a supporter of the channel and click that link when you need a website. Back to the show. The drone was basically designed around the engine. Unlike the A-12, which had turbojet engines, the D-21 was powered by a single Marcard RJ-41 ramjet engine with a maximum speed of Mark 3.4. René Leduc, eat your heart out. Slightly modified delta wing design was also chosen as the best one for this project, similar to the A-12 and a very flat fuselage to lower the radar cross section. A single high resolution camera was placed inside the so-called hatch, a small bay right behind the air intake which was waterproof and could be picked up after the mission. But let's not get ahead of ourselves just yet. As we mentioned the main engine was a ramjet one, but ramjet engines have one major flaw. They require a high starting speed and aircraft powered by them can't operate from the ground. Hence the drone would have to be launched from the air. To solve this problem, the engineers took an A-12 and used it as a launch platform, giving it the designation M-21, where M stands for mothership, and D not for drone, but for daughter, keeping the Lockheed spy business literally in the family. The remaining question is, how would the CIA put this new toy to work? It's actually pretty simple. The M21 takes off and reaches a certain altitude and speed where the ramjet engine of the D21 can be turned on safely. It then separates from the mothership, moves on a pre-programmed path and takes pictures, gets out of the Soviet airspace to international waters and releases the camera. Then a JC-130, a modified C-130, would capture the camera parachuting down mid-air, or if that failed, a Navy ship would pick it up when it lands in the sea. Meanwhile, the drone itself would self-destruct to avoid capture by the Soviets and risking any ramjet technology getting into their hands. 
burning up in the night sky somewhere over Siberia. Pretty easy, right? Well, not quite. On March 5th, 1966, the D-21 had its first launch from its mothership, and soon after, they were confident for a second test, where the drone reached its operational speed and altitude of Mach 3.3 and 27,000 meters, but it was lost due to a mechanical failure. The third test flight, although partially successful, wasn't a real win because the camera hatch wasn't released and it was lost with the drone burning up in the sky. So one success and two failures, they decided to try one last time, which would be a fatal mistake. The drone detached from the mothership, but didn't actually move out of the way and hit the tail section of the aircraft. At supersonic speed, the M21 was soon a ball of fire dropping into the sea, and even though the pilots managed to eject in time, one of them was unfortunately killed. This would be the last attempt with the M21 mothership, but the program was far from over. After the tragedy, Kelly Johnson proposed another solution. The problem wasn't with the drone, he said, but rather the mothership. So with yet another simple twist, he removed the problem. By modifying the B-52 to carry two drones on wing pylons, which was easy because of the already developed technology for cruise missiles, they now had a new mothership. But because the B-52 couldn't actually achieve the launch speed required for the ramjet to work, a sword fuel booster was added below the D-21 fuselage. Now by this point, the program was kind of hacked together and the CIA wasn't really impressed and wanted to pull the plug. But the Air Force said, hey, we spent all this money, let's at least test the concept and see how it works, stealing the program away from the CIA buddies. And the first real recon mission soon followed. During the development of all these spy technologies, the world situation had changed. China had managed to successfully test their first nuclear bomb, so the US government suddenly found itself spying in two places at once, and a great position to test their new aircraft. The first mission would be to spy on the Lop Nor nuclear test site, but this became a colossal failure when not only the drone lost its way, it actually flew over the border into the Soviet Union where it landed and self-destruct. I say that in air quotes and we'll come straight back to that in a minute. The second and third missions resulted in failure as well because although the route was completed successfully, the camera compartment was lost in both scenarios. The C-130 and Navy couldn't find it in the sea. The fourth and final mission in 1971 was, as you can guess, a failure with the drone crashing into China and the Chinese finding the wreck. Faced with massive international embarrassment, the program was cancelled soon after that because Nixon didn't want to upset China anymore. And by then, NASA had come knocking with a completely new concept, spy satellites. Now you could simply send up a rocket with a camera on board and get all of the footage you needed with no crazy ramjets involved. But remember that first mission that we mentioned where it crashed in the Soviet Union? Well, the Soviets came back with a little bit more than a wreck. After obtaining parts of the D-21 that failed to explode, the Tupolev Bureau, who was responsible for some of the very best Soviet aircraft, was quickly tasked with reverse engineering the drone. They came up with something called the Tupolev Voron, also powered by a ramjet RD-21 engine. The Soviets didn't have a launch platform like the M-21, so their first thought was to launch the new drone with a booster from a 295 or a modified bomber variant of the 2144. The drone would be equipped with a camera just like the D-21 and used for a single mission where the camera and equipment landed separately with a parachute upon completing the route. So pretty much completely reverse engineering the American spy drone. And just like the US, the Soviets realized that this was just too much work when you can use a satellite and the project was abandoned before the flight testing phase could even begin. So with spy satellites all the range, the Air Force found themselves with a warehouse of D-21 drones that didn't have a mothership to fly them anymore and didn't serve any purpose. 
Not to waste all their efforts, the Air Force tried to turn the D-21 into a cruise missile instead with a nuclear warhead. But further developments with nuclear rocket technology led them to realize this was a dumb idea as well. Several D-21s were built and never used, and one M-21 mothership also survived, where they're both displayed in a museum today. But do you know what's really funny? Is that the Chinese also have a D-21 on display in their museum the fourth one that apparently crashed and self-destructed in China during the 1960s. So this whole drone technology never really even worked in the first place. It's just a very interesting concept and far ahead of the time proved to be just too complicated and prone to failure. However, it's a perfect topic for Found and Explained to cover today. Thanks so much for watching and please do subscribe if you're new around here and check out many of our other videos on the channel.